Hello, everyone. And uh, it's very uplifting, actually, to see so many people. And I want to be, actually, I'd like to be, to see people. So I'm going to go into that gallery view to see. Yes, this is much better for me to be able to see all of you or at least some of you on that uh, on the screen. So it's um, it's very uplifting to be all together. Thank you for joining for so many countries in Europe. We have Denmark, France, Spain, Italy, England, Germany, Ireland, Belgium, Poland, and places in India, people from India, people from Canada, from Australia, from New Zealand, from Singapore and from Malaysia. So this is really very uplifting to have everybody coming uh, to, for our tents, your uh, virtual coffee for confined yogi. So this difficult uh, global pandemic is a year old now and has brought much suffering worldwide and has also created a need for connection without border. Way back in March 2020, we saw that by January 2021, we would be free of this pandemic and be back face to face. But this was not to come, right? And yes, so some of us are getting vaccine, as just Suzanne was saying, we are getting where the vaccination coming and there is some hope there is the spring is coming. Yet we're still, it will still take time for us to come back if ever to a pre-COVID situation. We're still dealing with some of the same issue of uncertainty, fear and loneliness. And now for a longer period of time, we're still in need of adjust our, adjusting our life and expectation at this time and maybe facing new challenges as the virus mutates. But thanks to the technology of Zoom in this virtual coffee, we have been reaching out to senior Iyengar yoga teacher worldwide, creating a global community of yogis interested in reflecting on our yogic practice during this time. My hope has been and still is that by, by hearing different voices of our senior teacher, we can learn from each other and feel connected as we strengthen, explore the many aspects of our yoga practice. So today our guest is one of our Boston area beloved teacher, Jarvis Chen. Jarvis Chen is a senior uh, intermediate certified Ayanga yoga teacher who lives, practices and teaches in Boston. He assists his teacher Patricia Walden regularly in classes and workshop. Jarvis has traveled annually to Pune and we see that his background and his heart is there in Pune, so, but he's still with us here in Boston. And Jarvis is known for his teaching from a quiet, grounded center of compassion. His seemingly endless knowledge about therapeutics allows him to see and take care of each student and help them explore, heal, and care for themselves. His work as a scientist is an epidemiologist, and his passion for public health pervades his classes in the best possible way. We are very lucky to have you speak to us today, Jarvis. Thank you very much for coming. So uh, let me just ask my first question right away and ask you, what do you think the leader of, of the leader or your guru, because Ayanga would have focused on during this pandemic, all aspects of the sadhana? And maybe a more fine question, which one of his teachings seems to you the most rele relevant to our current situation? Um, okay, so well, thank you, Rahel, uh, for the for that introduction. I just wanted to also say say thank you to Rahel and to Artemis Yoga for hosting this coffee and also for um, inviting me um, to to um, speak this afternoon. Or I guess I can I keep saying afternoon, but since you're all over the world, it's like morning, evening. It could be anywhere. Um, and I also want to say thank you because I feel very honored to be in this uh, sort of in the, the list of people who've been um, on these virtual coffees as a, as a quote unquote senior teacher, I feel very junior um, relative to the other people who have spoken. Um, and so um, I'm really you know, honored to be here and to also kind of hear from all of you um, as we go through about your experiences. I feel like this has been an unprecedented experience for our whole world, um, but one as yoga practitioners that kind of gives us an opportunity to confront our attachments and our um, sort of presumptions about the way we think our practice is supposed to work, the way we think the world is supposed to work. So um, I'm very interested in how all of you experience um, this time. Um, with respect to what Guruji would say, um, I mean, 
I, I don't know that I can speak for BKS Iyengar, but I can certainly imagine that he would have told us to continue to practice um, as the most important um, thing and something that Guruji embodied in his own life. Um, as many of you know, he came into the world during the 1918 um, Spanish influenza uh, pandemic and was profoundly affected by that. Um, and so I think that he, you know, when the, um, in previous influenza pandemics like the H1N1 in, in 2009, he, he was able to speak to this fact that the thing that most directly or most immediately affects us is fear. And so I think of his teachings, the thing that I think he would most want us to, um, to focus on is being courageous in the face of fear. Um, and certainly he's, he's talked a lot about being bold and being cautious um, and balancing boldness and caution um, in our approach to our practice and in our approach to, to our lives. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for this. So, so Jarvis, um, during this year, we have gone through many, many crises. So the virus itself, and at least in the US, the challenge of racial and economic justice, attack on truth, and now the chaotic vaccination for us, I don't, and I'm sure all over the world, people have had different challenges regarding all those issues. So what is at the forefront of your consciousness at this moment? Uh, so, I mean, uh, have sort of building on what you, you just asked or talked about, um, you know, I do think because I'm an epidemiologist, I am thinking a lot about the public health dimension of this, um, where we are in terms of vaccination and the hope that vaccination is going to enable us to um, move back into a sort of life, a social life beyond our, the four walls of, our, our, of where we're living. I think about that and I think about, of course, the, the equity issues involved with um, how the vaccine is being distributed and whether the people most vulnerable are going to have um, access to it. Related to that, to come back to this notion um, of overcoming fear, I do think that it's, um, you know, we're living in a, in a time of uncertainty around the vaccine um, and how it's going to be delivered and whether it's going to give us that promise um, of a life that returns somewhat to normal. I do think that most of my epidemiologist colleagues would say that, that we're never going to, I mean, life as we know it is different than it was pre um, 2020. And I think we're going to continue to see the need to um, have, for example, practice using masks or social distancing in addition to vaccinations as we move forward. Probably most epidemiologists think that coronavirus is going to settle into what we call an endemic pattern so that like influenza, there will be um, sort of surges of infections every year. We'll probably have to update the vaccine um, every year um, in order to, you know, to keep up with mutations in the vaccine, um, but that we will at some point be able to settle into that pattern um, and to have a life that is sort of more or rather less constrained um, than it has been. Um, but that's, I think, also related as we are in exactly this moment to this notion of how do we um, address the fear um, of, for example, will I be able to get the vaccine? Um, and how, you know, I've spent uh, the last few weeks, like many people in Massachusetts, sort of clicking on the, the vaccine registration, uh, like for appointments, trying to get um, a, an appointment. And I see many people who um, sort of have a lot of anxiety around that. And I think that, well, how do we use our yoga practice to manage, you know, or to help us through the like day to day of like, let me just do what I can today to get my vaccine appointment and then put it aside and then do what I can tomorrow. Um, of course, as um, you know, uh, in the US, as more vaccine doses have become available, hopefully that sort of bottleneck of getting a vaccine appointment um, is going to um, get easier for us. Um, but I also think about, um, you know, because we are a worldwide global community, we have to think about the fact that many countries um, don't have access to um, vaccines in the quantities or in the quality that the U.S. does. And I think that's something we have to think hard about as well. 
um, because of course we can't just think about protecting one country and assume that um, that you know having protected, for example, the U.S. that that's going to be a sustainable thing if we don't address vaccine equity in Asia and Africa and and for for that matter in Europe as well. So um, there are a lot of um, social justice issues to be considered in the equity um, and access, um, both of treatments and then also vaccinations. And so, you know, when I think about this in relation to being a yoga practitioner, I also think about, well, how can I use my yoga practice to help strengthen my um, resolve and my ability to act for the benefit um, of all? So I do think that that's, that's a challenge for us as yoga practitioners who, you know, in, in most parts of the, the world or in many parts of the world, we tend to be sort of advantaged in terms of socioeconomically or politically, um, but how do we use that um, advantage to benefit people who are less advantaged than us? And that's something that I think the yoga, um, yoga sutras and the yoga philosophy asks us to consider about what does it really mean to practice ahimsa? Um, mm -hmm. And what does it really man mean to practice a parigraha in terms of you know, non-harming and non also non-possessiveness? How do we distribute the benefits of, for example, vaccine technology for everyone. Mm -hmm. So, so that brings me to to uh, to to my question about what we ha what have we learned, and how as your practice, it, how is your practice infused by your by the yoga philosophy by the sutra? So you started with that. So maybe we should continue in that direction. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I feel a little bit like I'm meandering back and forth between being an epidemiologist and being a yoga practitioner in this conversation. So forgive me a little bit if I feel like I'm ping-ponging um, back and forth. Um, I do think that even, um, so uh, I think one way to think about this is to sort of chart our progress. Um, I can tell you about my personal experience <laughs> over the pandemic of progress, which is that in the very beginning in March, I think we were all in shock um, at what was happening and the way that our lives sort of became very constrained very suddenly. Um, there was a sort of overwhelming feeling of not knowing what was going to happen um, and how to manage that. Um, and so um, at that time, I really felt that, uh, you know, going sort of just being by myself in my practice room was sort of the best thing that I could do for myself, but I had to sort of find out what was the most nourishing and sustaining um, kind of practice to have, even beyond any sort of lofty ideals of yoga philosophy or um, putting that into practice. There was just the sort of taking care of my own body, taking care of my own mind. Um, and so that was sort of my initial feeling. And I do know that at the time I had many conversations with my colleagues about, well, what are the best kinds of sequences to be practicing? Should we be doing you know, supine work? Should we be doing supported forward bending work? And should we doing, be doing inversions? And how do we work with pranayama when there was so much fear in the body that it was hard to take a breath? So all of those things um, were things that, you know, I think many of you, I can well imagine, were working with as well. Um, and I think that we, we learned some ways of working with ourselves, both individually um, and as a, as a sort of yoga community. Um, and then I think that as things progressed throughout 2020, um, at least for me, one of the things I did was I got very involved in my work um, as an epidemiologist, both doing sort of work on um, understanding COVID disparities, which is one of the things I do work on, as well as um, taking care of my students um, who are my, not my yoga students, but also I was taking care of them, but also taking care of my uh, students at the School of Public Health in terms of um, trying to figure out how to maintain their education given that we were meeting um, remotely. And what happened with that was that I felt like I was in a bit of a vortex of work. Um, and so I guess Sometimes I wondered because other people were saying, oh, I have all this free time being in lockdown at home. I started to feel like I had no free time because I was working all the time and you know, one Zoom meeting would run into another meeting. And so when that started to happen and my practice suffered 
a lot as a result, I had to sort of change my perspective on what it meant to practice and how I was using my practice. So I had to sort of go back to what it used to be much more like when I was just starting out as a practitioner where um, instead of having a long practice of several hours where I could really go deep, I might have to on some days have little bits of practice that were scattered throughout my day, but that would connect me back to myself. Um, you know, if I had, you know, 20 minutes between one meeting and another meeting um, or something like that. And then as things progressed into the winter, um, fall and winter, and when it really started to be clear, like this was really going to, this is really going to continue on for a good part of a year. And certainly now, as we look forward, thinking it will probably continue well into um, 2021 and maybe even the beginning of next year, um, sort of reassessing this idea that, you know, yoga for difficult times. So I was sort of thinking about this last night about, um, you know, I mean, what might BKS Iyengar say about yoga for difficult times, given that he lived a long life through the 20th century and saw many difficult times. I think one way to reframe this is to say, all times are difficult times. Um, right. I mean, it's not that there was one some perfect time and now we're out of that and we're trying to get back to it. We've always had difficulties that come up that we have to confront um, and to deal with. And so if we can get away from thinking that, um, I mean, I found I had to get away from thinking that there was something specially difficult about this time um, and start to say, I have to just begin to work um, in a way that um, takes into account what's going on right now and then do the needful. Um, so I was thinking about a, uh, a concrete example of this that maybe some of you can relate to. So I was thinking about, um, so I, you know, at various times in my um, practice, I've had um, neck difficulty, like neck injury, and at various times, uh, headstand, Shirshasana has been difficult for me. And so I think what sometimes happens is you first get a neck injury and you say, and uh, especially if you got the neck injury doing Shirshasana, like maybe I was doing Shirshasana variations and I hurt my neck. And so first you say, I can't do Shirshasana at all. So you rest it and you, it's good, you should rest it. And then you say, well, I need to do some neck things to get back to Shirshasana, but I'm afraid of doing Shirshasana. I can't, you know, I won't do Shirshasana, so I'll do other things, I'll do Prasarada Padottanasana when they say to do Shirshasana, I'll do Viprita Dandasana on a chair, I'll do Shirshasana between two chairs, I'll do Shirshasana hanging on the rope. But at some point, as a dedicated practitioner, you say, well, my neck is not going to get better unless I confront Shirshasana. And so at some point, at least for me, I have to say, let me do Shirshasana and understand where is Shirshasana going wrong in the neck and let me solve that problem. Now to do that, it takes discrimination, it takes um, you know, razor sharp awareness to be able to understand what's going wrong in Shirshasana, but it also takes courage to confront that Shirshasana um, and to find a way to fix what can be fixed or to um, you know, evolve what can be evolved, even while being um, aware of what can't be changed at that particular moment. Um, and I do think that that's sort of where we are right now, if we think like, okay, if we try to go beyond the yoga for difficult times sort of framework and think it's yoga for the times that we're in, how do I approach it um, with what can be cha changing, what can be changed, working on what can be worked on, as well as acknowledging the fact that life is completely different than it was before. Um, so um, I also think about, I think, uh, this idea that ultimately when you have an injury in yoga, often you have to go back to the pose that injured you in order to really change um, and you can't just avoid it. So, mm -hmm. um, all right, I'm gonna stop the rambling there and let you ask me. No, I, I um, so, so what I wanted to ask you is how is this connected to basically our two main concepts in yoga, Vairagya and Abhyasa? When is it that you say, this is it, 
I am not going there. And when is it a courage? So when is really you need the courage to go there and to really work on your neck? But when is there a, a, a moment where you say, no, this is not right. So, and that's also what's happening in the world. So when is it, mm -hmm. what is that balance and how do we get there? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's each one of us for himself or herself. I just don't know. What we yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. Isn't that the like, that's the million dollar question, right? I mean, not just putting aside the pandemic, like that's the million dollar question for our lives in general. But mm -hmm. certainly I feel like the stakes are very high during the pandemic because it's not only our own personal opinion about what's happening with us. It's the fact that our actions can have profound effects on other people that we need to think about. And I think that's also the stress of this. I think I've talked to many people who say, you know, the fear that they have is that by doing something, going out in public, you know, agreeing to meet someone for coffee or whatever, the fear is about that they might harm or infect someone else. It's not just about the fear of being infected yourself. It's about the fear of, of what you might inadvertently or unaware to yourself do to someone else. And I think that's, um, but that's a good thing to, to know about yourself, that that the spark of compassion that motivates that, that's a good thing. The, the fear and our reaction to that fear, um, that's the tricky thing. We, we all know that, um, you know, for many people, their reaction to that fear is denial. <laughs> Right, that's what we're seeing when people are saying, I don't want to wear masks, I don't want to practice social distancing. It's that sort of a reaction. No, I don't care what happens to other people, I just care about what happens. You are muted, you muted yourself for some reason. You're muted. Oh, I don't know how I muted myself, but here you are. <laughs> All right, here I am. So I think that's that's often so you know, good to distinguish the spark of compassion that's the initial, that's the truth. And then our reaction to that truth, because we can't handle the emotion of that, that's the denial. Um, so uh, one of the things I think of our yoga practice is doing for us is helping us um, undo the patterns of our denial, right? I mean, if we're undoing our habitual sort of thought processes and ways that we respond to things, our, our samskaras, that is undoing things like denial. Um, and that requires moment to moment awareness. Um, and it requires the ability to be quiet um, and to perceive directly um, the state of our emotions and the state um, of the world. Um, I like to think that, you know, sometimes I think, well, it's, we can, it's all very well and good to talk about this as a lofty philosophical principle. But I think that that's exactly what we do when, for example, you do Uttida Trikonasana, and you say, moment to moment, am I about to injure my knee because I haven't turned my knee out enough or because I straightened it too aggressively? Like, how do you, you know, moment to moment know I need to straighten my knee, but if I over straighten my knee or I press the shin down um, and my knee isn't in the right alignment, it will injure it. So that like moment to moment um, awareness, discrimination that allows you not to injure your knee. It's the same thing we're practicing when we say moment to moment, I'm about to take an action in the world. Is it going to injure someone else? Mm -hmm. um, and so our ability to tolerate the emotion, the difficult emotions that come around our fears of injuring someone else or our fears of getting infected ourselves, um, that's very much like what we do what we practice in asana and what we practice um, more broadly through yoga. So let me ask you about self-direction because you are mm -hmm. just touching about that topic in a sense. You are saying, how do we become self-directed and that how do we know what is the process of us knowing that we can trust ourselves and in our own practice? and mm -hmm. also in the world. So it's the same. So the, mm -hmm. the parallel that you are doing, moving from epidemiology to yoga is actually exactly what we should be doing, like moving from those two, two aspects of yeah. our practice, right? I mean, I, I love this, um, this uh, expression they use in India about doing the needful. 
Mm -hmm. um, because because it feels so right like that it's uh, there are times in our lives when we have to perceive what needs to be done um, and what needs to be done meaning like what will um, sort of help evolve us forward without injuring other people without hurting ourselves etc and then also what needs to be done at that particular moment um, you know in the right way um, and and how do we know that um, and I also um, appreciate Prashant has talked um, a lot about this, about that sort of um, that form of knowing by which everything that needs to be known is known. And it's so interesting for me to think about as a um, scientist, because it feels like that kind of knowing is about intuitive knowing. It isn't about sort of a line of deductive reasoning or sort of a, a sort of intellectual process. It's something that's um, it's a kind of knowing that's sort of true in a much deeper way that I actually have trouble um, putting into words. Um, so um, uh, I do feel like how do we how do we cultivate that knowledge that comes in a flash? Um, Rahel, I think in your your questions that you emailed to me, you asked about um, this distinction between instinct um, and intuition. And I remember um, you know one year, uh, a few years, not not too many years ago, before Guruji passed, that one uh, time I was there, and he was talking a lot about this notion of instinct and intuition. Where instinct is when you go to a pose and your 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 body does something, or you do something in your body, um, that's your first initial response to doing the pose, um, and it may or may not be the right action that has to be done. Um, but then there's a layer of this, which is intuition, um, as distinct from instinct, is where your um, that part of you or that awareness within you that tells you how to correct what you're doing um, in a way that evolves your pose or brings the truth of your pose to light um, and is often a reaction or is often a correction of your body's initial instinct. So for example, um, you know, there are many times in poses where you'll go to a pose and your, um, I'm trying to think of a good example and now it's escaping me, but your body will react in a way, something will, a muscle will grip, for example, and that you, uh, your body thinks that that gripping is going to help you. But in fact, you need to, to intervene and do something different or in a more subtle way or in a more, um, refined way in order to make space so that the pose doesn't um, cause harm to you, for example. Um, for some reason, the, the, um, the example that's occurring to me is like many times in uh, when you're first learning to do backward extensions, learning to do uh, backbends, um, we will think that we need to somehow tuck the tailbone or sort of you know, move the tailbone aggressively in in order to uh, prevent us injuring our lower backs, right? And so the body's instinct might be to grip the buttocks really strongly um, in order to make that happen. But if we over grip the buttocks or we over tuck the tailbone in, that can paradoxically or maybe not so paradoxically create more pain or more injury. And then we have to learn, okay, what's the balance? How do you turn the backs of the thighs? How do you move the buttock flesh down without over gripping the surface layers of the buttock that make the thighs turn out and then makes it jam into your lower back? So I don't know that that example is occurring to me right now, but, but we often have that experience um, where we have to distinguish what's the instinct that um, is immediately occurring to us and then what's where is intuition helping us um, to refine that action mm -hmm. um, so if you wanted to to make the parallel for example um, to to what's happening in our sort of pandemic situation um, we're weighing for example um, uh, you know um, getting together with friends for the holidays for example we have like um, our desire for um, connection might say, oh, it's really important that we get together um, in a particular way. And then how do we say, well, how do I manage the risk of that getting together 
Like we have to acknowledge that yes, it is important to live our lives and to have emotional connection with other people. And maybe it's not a tenable thing to say, we'll never get together. I will stay in my room and never see anyone else. So how do we use our um, situational awareness and our understanding and our intuition to guide us? So we say, well, it would be fine if we got together outside. It's mm -hmm. fine if we get together and we're wearing masks outside, but we might refrain from hugging each other, but we might, you know, touch elbows or something like that because physical contact is important and maybe touching elbows while wearing a mask and is, is okay, right? So there are like many levels of harm reduction, that's what we would call it in public health, um, that we can um, call upon to sort of adjust our behavior without um, being sort of swept up in the all or nothing thing of like, I can't see anyone at all, or if I'm gonna see people, I might as well do it inside, not wear masks and just pretend that there's no coronavirus. So the, I have so many questions to ask you and uh, we'll be here for three or four hours. So I'm going to, to, cut, to, to cut and ask you question, two questions. One is what has surprised you the most in your own practice and in your teaching this year? Yeah, so um, what has surprised me, I think, is uh, in both the, um, let, let me put it this way, I was surprised by my own reaction um, in terms of practicing at home to feeling um, like, to seeing, oh, all of these things that I thought were part of my yoga practice, which is like getting together and practicing together or taking classes together with my teacher, all of those things that I thought were like, without that, what would I do? Mm -hmm. I was surprised to find that, yes, I can survive without that interaction in that way. So I think that was like the first thing of sort of cutting through, like, what does it really mean to be a yoga practitioner? It's not, you know, um, uh, being in class and, and getting, uh, you know, that experience, like that yoga practice is not in class, right? I mean, I knew that already. I knew that yoga practice was something that we did um, ultimately by ourselves at home. That's where the real sort of, where the real action is. We go to class to learn, um, but we really practice at home, right? So that was sort of being reminded of that was important. Um, I was also really surprised. So when I started teaching, online in March, I really um, thought, well, let me do this because it's a temporary thing. It won't last forever, but my students are asking for me to teach um, and it's a way that we can get together. And I thought, well, it's not ideal, but let me do that. And I have been surprised to see that my students are actually thriving um, with this kind of um, experience of taking yoga class online. You know, I really thought like, if I'm not there to adjust them, what will their experience be? If we're not together, I, I can barely see people on these tiny screens. Um, I was really thinking, you know, this is just a temporary thing. It won't last forever and I'll do it. What I found is that people really enjoy it. Um, people really thrive with it. And many people are able to take responsibility for their own practice um, in a way that um, they weren't doing before. Um, when we were, um, you know, always together. So, um, so that's been a wonderful um, thing to learn. I do think that um, as we move forward, I mean, I feel like the world of yoga teaching is, has been forever changed by being online, um, in part because um, so many studios I know, physical studios have had to close. Um, a lot of studios have struggled in terms of being able to pay the rent. I know a lot of them have closed. And I also think a lot of our students have realized that, oh, it's so much more convenient to attend a class online and not be fighting for parking. Someone told me yesterday they haven't had a parking ticket in over a year. Um, so, you know, I think when we come back to in-person classes, we're going to have to learn what our students want. I think there will always be students who do want to come back um, and practice in person. I think that's an important part of community.
for many people and certainly an important part of learning. But I do think that this sort of online experience has fundamentally changed the dynamics of yoga students and, and yoga teachers, both in, in good ways and then also maybe in not so good ways. So, yeah. um, and that's something that we're just going to have to learn about. So th that brings me to what are we lost? Because I, I really feel that what you're saying is, is right. So for some of us being an, an student have been telling me that I am now just with you in my, uh, you are on the big screen, I'm with you. I don't see anybody else, I can do my practice. And I feel as a, as a teacher and as a yoga practitioner, I have lost a lot by not being, by not being able to be in physically with other people in, in a studio. So mm -hmm. what do you think we have lost by doing that, that will be regained, hopefully, when we come back into the studio. Um, so I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that um, I miss um, seeing my students in person and being able to see them from all angles. I miss being able to um, adjust people and interact with their bodies um, and their energies in, in ways that sort of, um, you know, help them as well as sort of help me to help them and our understanding together. Um, I think that's a, um, you know, I mean, early on you talked about Iyengar Yoga Therapeutics. I think that, um, you know, this is a, a piece that many of our students really benefited from that they're not experiencing um, in the same way right now. Although at the same time, I'm pleasantly surprised by how, you know, when I take the time to work with a student in class, um, or to make a you know make a separate time for me to talk to them and sort of try to work with the props that they have in their room and help them verbally to put themselves into a pose um, or work in a particular way with their prop. I'm pleasantly surprised that a lot can be communicated um, this way. And maybe maybe that's actually a good thing because it makes them take responsibility for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, to help their knee problem or help their back problem, et cetera. So that's good. But there are definitely times where I wish I could reach into the screen and adjust someone. Mm -hmm. um, and I miss that part. I feel like I, I miss that part of using my hands and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, helping people um, in that way. So, um, so I do think that that's something I'm looking forward to when we're able to meet in person again. Um, but I think that this question of um, loss is, um, you know, is tricky because um, we're always losing things. You know, I mean, as things change, there we have to give up certain things, um, even as new things come to light that we can um, benefit from. And so I think that if we take a look at that loss and we we sort of become emotionally wrapped up in the experience of loss um, and, and we stay attached to what we feel it is that we lost, we kind of lose out on the ability to, to move forward. Um, at the same time that it's important to acknowledge that we have a sense of loss. I've been thinking a lot about this right now, it's March, and so it's really been a year Mm -hmm. For most of us, since we've been together in person, it's been a year since we've had an in-person class, it is absolutely appropriate to have feelings about that mm -hmm. and to um, acknowledge that we've experienced a loss. But then there are ways in which new things have come to light, like it never occurred to us that we could have an online Zoom meeting worldwide with Iyengar yoga practitioners every month and share our experiences. And that actually could have happened before the pandemic it probably didn't occur to us to do it right. um, but now it will certainly occur to us to do it right mm -hmm. and so that's a positive thing that we can continue to to have so i think i guess to to summarize i would say that we should be um you know it's important to mark our losses um and to grieve for the things that we've lost as well as to um, cultivate the opportunities that come to us. I keep coming back to in my head, um, Guruji, um, I think it was in 2005 during the Light on Life tour talking about, um, we have to turn our disappointments into appointments. Mm. Uh, and so that's one of, when I think about things that he said, that's one that comes back to me this year about like so many disappointments we've had, how do we turn them into appointments? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So does it bring me to maybe, uh, we are going to open it soon to, uh, to people to ask questions, but before we do that, I want to ask one more question about your teaching. And mm -hmm. how has your, your relationship to your teaching changed through the year? What have you learned from, what have you learned from that year in your teaching? So um, as, I, as I mentioned, when I first started um, teaching online, I thought, well, I'm going to, I mean, my inclination was to be very conservative and very careful about, for example, you know, not being able to adjust people or be in the room with them, like teaching things that put, put students at risk, you want to be really careful about, for example. Um, and so I also feel like um, over the course of the year, I really worked on my verbal skills um, because I couldn't work on my manual skills. So I really had to work on how I use language. Um, and I do feel like that's something that's been continually evolving for me, how to use language um, in a very precise way to help people do things, um, adjust their own poses, but also using language in an inspirational way um, sometimes using language in a poetic way, um, using language to help people have a deeper experience of themselves that isn't just about turning your knee out or pressing the back foot or whatever. So um, I think I've, that's been something I've felt good about having the opportunity to work on. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that because of this aspect of teaching where I feel like we do have to be more conservative about um, you know, insisting that the whole class stay together if it's a class um, of many different levels. Um, and it's appropriate for some people to be doing the pose this way, but appropriate for other people to, to be doing it that way. You know, in the past, I might've been more in, as insistent on everyone doing it the same way because then I could also go around the room and help people do it you know, the way that I'm teaching it. I'm much more inclined these days to give multiple options um, while I'm teaching. And I don't mean like this option is less than this option, or this is like a modification you do because you want to avoid doing the pose or whatever. What I mean by multiple options, I'm giving multiple options where people are working at their capacity and they're getting something from it. They are evolving in some way um, in the pose that's appropriate for them. So I've gotten, I feel like I've really made a commitment to, to doing that so that no one feels like they're left behind and no one um, feels that they're sort of doing a less than pose while everyone else is doing the quote unquote real pose. Cause that's just a, that's a false, yeah. that's a false distinction <laughs> um, in my mind. Um, I'm f fortunate because, um, you know, I've kept my classes relatively small so that I can see people on like maybe two screens um, and I can try to make sure that, that people get, um, you know, um, attention and individualized attention. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, before I open it uh, to everybody to ask questions, is there anything I should have asked you or you want to say before we open it to the, to the, to the, to the uh, audience to ask question. Um, I, I actually, I'm really just eager to hear what, what people okay. want to talk about. Um, okay, good. I, this is the long, I feel like this is the longest I've been asked to kind of speak um, uh, in an expert way <laughs> um, about yoga practice and yoga philosophy in relation to the pandemic. So. Um, so I would love to hear um, from everyone else at this point. Great. So we're going to open it. And uh, so Trish and Liz, help me look uh, if people have questions and you can raise your virtu virtual hand and, and, and then we'll call on you and, and mute yourself. So let's see. We're going to go through the, the screens and see if there is any questions. James, James has, has, has a question. James, do you want to mute yourself? Hi, Jarvis. Thanks for Hi. coming to us today. Um, uh, Prashan says that if nothing else, yoga is an inward practice. And um, Vyasa says that the mind moves in two directions, or the or mind is like a river that flows in two directions, um, one to the external, one to the internal. And there's a, a big irony for all of us here, 
and that uh, this is such a great opportunity. I mean, I've been able to take classes with the greatest Iyengar teachers in the world and, and to really concentrate and, and to focus inwardly. But at the same time, the world is such a hell of a mess. Who can resist reading the New York Times front page and the Washington Post front page and the Guardian, you know, like five times a day and everything is going crazy. So this, um, we need to make such a conscious um, distinction and to stop going so externally, even though it's so tempting and to go inward. And I'm just wondering if you can give us some advice on that. Um. I, I personally would love some advice on that as well. I feel like I have spent a lot of time, as they say, doom scrolling this year, um, meaning like, you know, scrolling through social media, like, and sort of compulsively looking for the next horrible thing um, that's happened. Um, but but I, I agree that there's sort of this Vyutana samskara that we can build up, which is the outward going mind, and then the Niroda samskara that we can work on, which is the ingoing mind. And, and I do think that our yoga practice um, helps us to, to do that, um, to cultivate the nirodha samskara, which is so um, important in developing um, evenness of mind, um, equanimity. Um, but I also think that um, at, at, uh, in a sort of embodied way, um, that this distinction between outgoing and ingoing, um, we can reframe in a different way, which is to say that what is it that makes us as individuals able to be instruments of positive change, instruments for reducing suffering in the world? So, you know, if I just approach the outgoing, sort of if I just go with the outgoing, um, I get flustered and anxious and angry and emotionally disturbed, and it makes me not very effective um, as an agent of change in the world. But if I can cultivate that inward um, going mind, and then from that stable place within me, um, look outward, um, then it makes me someone who's able to act without attachment in the world um, and see what are, you know, again, to come back to that idea of doing what is needful, um, you know, makes me into someone who's better able to or more affected, more effective at addressing what needs to be addressed in the world. So I don't think it's just, you know, external mind, internal mind, and we, and we just, if we just, you know, stay in our houses and practice yoga by ourselves, that that's going to be um, the solution. I think that we need that um, inward going experience in order to clarify our own intentions, our own consciousness, um, to develop, as Guruji would say, um, our conscience, right? The, the, um, the antakarna or the um, dharmendriya, the organ of, um, of, of dharma, of um, that conscience within us so that we can act in positive ways in the world. Thank you, Jarvis. Thank you, James. Uh, I see we have um, a few more. Barbara questions. had a question. Baba, yeah, and then Jennifer. Is so and Jennifer, yeah. Okay, so please, Baba, unmute yourself and ask your question. It looks like Barbara might have had to go. She took her hand down, Barbara. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Jennifer, it's your turn. Are you still here, Jennifer? Nancy Preston raised her hand. So Nancy. Yes, hi, thank you. And good to see all of you here. So my question, you know, Jarvis, you were talking about, you know, social justice and uh, the studio where I teach, we had to give up our two studio physical places and we actually are converting into a workers co-op and try facing and embracing how we can better serve the community at large and people that have been lost um, and unable to participate in yoga classes. Of course, we can see that in our constituency of students and really trying to face that. And I'm curious, it's, it's quite challenging. And I'm curious as to uh, anything you might have to add or advice in pursuing this and really bringing yoga 
um, in embracing the yamas and the niyamas and social justice. Um, thank you, Nancy. I really um, appreciate what what your collect collective is doing, and I think that's such great work to be doing. And I know that it is is hard work. Um, you know, from my um, background in community public health, like doing work um, in communities and with communities and with the participation of communities is a long term process. It really takes time to develop the relationships of trust. Um, in order to do that kind of work, but it is so worth it. Um, and so um, I think that that's great to hear that you're doing it. And I also know, you know, there are other groups, uh, Iyengar yoga groups in the United States who are doing similar work. Um, for example, the Detroit Collective is doing fantastic work um, in their community. And so I think that's, that's really um, worth doing. Um, and, you know, along with that, just to say that, um, uh, one of the things I'm seeing in terms of my work on COVID disparities is that communities across the United States certainly have been very unevenly affected. So I have to say that in my direct social network or the people I you know, work with, interact with at work, or even my, my yoga students, most of us have been able to work from home, have not suffered a lot of direct loss in our um, networks from people getting sick with COVID and dying. Um, but I also know of communities that have been really devastated where whole families have been, um, have suffered huge losses, um, where people are experiencing huge economic losses um, due to COVID. So, you know, this, this question of how, as I said, um, you know, we're working on ourselves to hopefully make us more compassionate um, agents of change in the world. Um, I think, you know, coming back to the question of, okay, how do we, um, then take our energy to the places where it's most needed um, becomes really important. And how do we do that in a way that also respects um, communities and where they're coming from and lets them define what their needs are um, and how they want them to be addressed. That's like hugely important um, work. Um, I would say that, um, you know, the, the advice that I hear most often is certainly like, People like um, Gui Sak Hong have, have talked about this is just about showing up for the community, not with our own agenda, you know, which is like, oh, we want everyone to be practicing yoga, but to, to show up with the like, how can I, as a member of this community or someone who shares space with this community, um, be helpful in, for example, promoting voter registration or addressing the issues of schools and like how schools are going to um, start um, educating in person again, or how can I um, show up and, and help with vaccine equity, um, as well as how can I show up and say, if you are um, you know, stressed and anxious and yoga could be something that might be helpful for you and here are some resources that we have as yoga practitioners that um, if you would be willing to try it out, um, would be, could be helpful to you. Um, so I think it's like showing up in all those many ways, um, but that's also like about showing up as humans, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Any more questions, anyone? Any questions on any topics related to yoga, the pandemic? Oh, I forgot that I wanted to say something about the background. So uh, many of you have noticed that I have the um, Institute um, in Pune, the practice hall up as my background. And I, I sort of had debated like what background to put up because I like to put up a background because the yoga room behind me is really not that glamorous. Um, and I was talking to my friend and colleague Purnima um, about this. And um, so the reason why I have that up is that, especially as we got into December and January this year, I felt keenly homesick for being in the practice hall at the Institute. Um, uh, and um, so when I put up this background, it's because I have a strong emotional connection. It makes me feel um, connected to um, the home of Iyengar Yoga. Um, and in thinking about that, it reminded me that Guruji has often said that yoga is an emotional subject, um, that it is, you know, about those feelings of tenderness 
um, and compassion and sort of that feeling of connection that we have that enables us to transform um, our consciousness. So it's about embodying that kind of love. Um, and so this background I put up today to help me feel connected, but I hope that especially for those of you who travel regularly to the Institute that it also um, helped you feel um, connected to, to Pune and to the Institute and that place where Guruji practiced in that corner, like, where's that corner? Like, I guess it's that way in the back, right? For so many years and created that energy in that room that affected all of us, transformed all of us, continues to transform all of us in, in wonderful ways. So thank you, Ravis. Any, any questions? Any? Okay, so Linda, 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 please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, forgive me for being off camera. I'm in an odd location at the moment. Um, my question, Jarvis, is that I have found some of the answer to this is obvious, but I'm just curious about your input. I so enjoyed a workshop that you taught at Artemis. It was uh, wonderful and helpful. And um, I've been finding that part of the challenges of these days is that as human beings, we are adaptive. We adapt to what's going on. So we have adapted to our daily world. But I'm also aware that there are parts of my psyche and just deeper body that are still even just walking outside and seeing everyone in masks and the way that we're living, that there are things going on on deeper levels that I'm having trouble getting at. <laughs> but I mm. know that those things are happening. It will show up in sort of strange little bouts of anxiety or strange whatever, even though overall I feel like I'm doing okay. And although overall, obviously yoga helps with that, I'm just curious for you yourself or in general, what you feel has been particularly helpful in getting to those areas? Um, this is such a great question. I, I'm remind, I was reading an article um, this morning about, um, I think they call it third quarter syndrome. It's something that people who have um, had to live in, um, in isolated circumstances like um, you know, being stationed um, at McMurdo um, in Antarctica or being on a submarine that's like, you know, deployed and spending like whole weeks under the water or um, people, you know, involved in those like experiments about what will life be like on Mars. So they're like locked in a, in a sort of environment for like days on end and what they experience, um, what people have often said is that um, they adapt as we all adapt as humans, we're very adaptable, they adapt but then it's like in that third quarter when it's suddenly the prospect that it's gonna be over soon comes up, that suddenly it gets very difficult. Like mm -hmm. people get very cranky or very testy um, or thing, little things that you thought you had adapted to that weren't gonna bother you suddenly start, start bothering you um, again. And so I was thinking, oh yeah, I actually feel like that is for many of us where we are. We're sort of, the vaccine is helping us see light at the end of the tunnel and then suddenly the things that we thought we had sort of adapted to are suddenly um, rearing up again. You know, I, I do think that um, this is part and parcel of being human. Um, I think that our ability to um, have self-awareness and see ourselves clearly is key to being able to process those emotions. I do think that we need to be in community with one another to help us um, process that. So having friends that we can talk to about that um, it becomes really important. Um, and I do think that also as, as um, Iyengar yoga practitioners, we know that a lot of those emotions um, exist in the body. They're somaticized, you know, they exist in our tissues. And sometimes when we don't have the, even the language to work through something, um, the body has a language through movement, through asana, um, to work on something. And so, um, you know, some combination of being able to talk about it, but also some combination um, of being able to um, work through our asana practice can help with those um, things. But it's a multi-layered experience. And I do think that um, 
you know, I was thinking about this. I, I already spend a lot of time at home, like during regular times. Um, and so I've been sort of this question of like, why is it that I've been at home doing things no differently than I might otherwise do them, but somehow for some reason it started to get like really like, oh my gosh, I have to go out and go do something or see someone human who isn't, um, you know, a virtual figure on my screen. Like, where does that come from? Um, so I think that being able to say like, what is it that we're craving and how do we, um, how can we address that need um, while staying safe? Like those have, that's been a really important thing to continue to do. That's what I sort of meant about like, why it's so important to do things like say, yes, it's okay to get together with my family if we're outside and we're both, we're all wearing masks or something like that. Or once we're vaccinated, um, you know, yes, it's true that, um, you know, being vaccinated, um, we still don't know completely whether vaccines prevent you from getting infected, but it reduces your risk enough. We think that it reduces your risk of getting infected a lot where I might expand my pod and say, it's okay to see my um, parents, for example, um, in person. I haven't seen them in over a year, but they're both vaccinated now. I just had the first of my vaccinations. So I think probably in a few weeks after I get my second one, I think it's it would be reasonable for me to see them again. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, what I mean, meant about that is to say that um, it's great that you're, you're able to notice when these things come up, there are messages to you about the multi-layered state of your emotions and, and our work as yoga practitioners is to, is to be able to reflect on that um, and understand it and sort of take it apart and, and then um, evolve our relationship to our emotions. So I think that's ultimately a good thing. So thank you, Jarvis. Thank you, Linda, for that question. I was thinking to myself that this morning I, I, I woke up so crappy and I went outside and I met my neighbors and I stayed with my neighbors and we started chatting for like 10, 15 minutes and suddenly I felt so much better. Like having met a human which is outside of what I, my, my, my husband or whoever is in my, is my house. So, so yeah, absolutely. This is what is happening to all of us. So I want to ask if there is any more, anyone or that has another question or another comment to Jarvis. And if not, I'm going to close the meeting because we're about- Patricia. Patricia, yeah. Patricia has, a, has a hand up. So please, Patricia. Yes, thank you, Jarvis. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask um, a question for the practice. Uh, already asked in the in the chat, and Liz, uh, Lisa replied to me. But I want to ask you, uh, you know, your opinion as uh, also uh, an epidemiologist. Here in Italy, we have a, a vaccine called AstraZeneca, and he, it has a, 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 many side effects. So I, I know many people, my students also are going through this in these days. And normally in, at the beginning, when they get the shot, they have pain in the arm. And then in the night, the fever is, uh, is becoming higher, 39, 39.5. And in the days after, they feel very, very weak. Sometimes they got nausea. Would you please uh, uh, suggest us some uh, uh, practice to do in the day you got the shot, in the day after, and when you feel so weak, please? Um, so I mean, I think the most important thing is to rest. Um, and so you probably know from your own practice, what are the poses that help you to rest deeply? Um, you know, I mean, of course the obvious ones are supine, um, masanas like supta baddha konasana, supta virasana, et cetera, situ bandha sarvangasana, viparita karani, those things are sort of expected things. Um, you know, when the fatigue lasts for several days, I think like, I mean, again, sleep is probably the best thing we can do um, when we're under those circumstances. Um, certainly not to exert yourself if you have a fever, for example. Um, uh, you know, with, um, with nausea, sometimes you have to see um, sort of whether, uh, one thing I would, I, I, let me put it this way. Um, 
because sometimes people say, okay, let me give these poses as a, pre as a prescription and then that people do them, but they don't necessarily feel good. So one thing to, to see is like, um, is your body inclined to accept the support of being on, you know, supported Supta Baddha Konasana, things like that? Or do you need to be flatter because the body um, doesn't want to accept that sort of being uplifted so much with the prop? Um, Prashant recently made this point that yes, um, you know, supported supine asanas on the supports um, um, do you spread the front of the lungs, um, for example, but they also have a way of blocking the diaphragm. Um, so he was having us explore lying flat without supports and to observe the difference in the breath between them. And that really has made me think a lot about like, you know, our go-to poses are often to put people on bolsters and there's always, those aren't necessarily always the best things to do. I think you have to explore that. And of course, you know, we know that forward bends uh, supported forward bends can be very good when we're feeling tired. Um, I think that when you have nausea, you have to see whether um, the abdomen needs to be, you know, long and free, or whether it's okay to bend forward um, with that, you know, that slight compressing action in the abdomen. So, um, so I would refrain from saying that there's a prescription of what you should do. Um, and just to say like, how do you feel? And then like, what are the things from your practice from, um, you know, what does your instinct tell you and what does your intuition tell you about what's the best way um, to proceed? Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Jarvis. I really, this was wonderful that you came and you Give us so much knowledge and so much of your compassion. I'm really thankful to you and to everybody who's who came today to this to this meeting. And I want also to thank the Ayanga Association of New England and Artemis Yoga for their support. And as we all know, we need a strong community to be able to create in this world. It's also a time to remind ourselves that we are all interconnected. So this pandemic has been showing us that, but it's, it's, it is in our interconnection that our creativity, the pandemic also, but the healing can flourish. So it's all together. We have to be able to see the two sides of, uh, of that coin. And, um, and I would, that's basically what I have to say. And I would also love to hear from any of you about your experience of those coffee and uh, please connect to us. So it's really important for us to be connected and, uh, and it's really nice to see all of you. And I really want to thank everybody again for coming. And if anybody wants to say anything, just say it. If not, we're going to close the meeting. And thank you again, Jarvis. This was wonderful and as usual, you are a wonderful teacher and we're so grateful to have you in our community. And now the community has expanded, right? This is, we have people from all over the world. So wonderful, yes, thank so you. Thank you and, and thank you all for joining us this, um, not afternoon, it could be morning, it could be evening, but um, thank you for joining us. I've really appreciated seeing so many um, faces here today. So, thank you. Thank you. So we're going to close the meeting, yeah, everybody. Thank you, Jarvis. Thank you.